Hi, I'm Tracy Watts with Mercer Health News. Our topic today is election 2024, the healthcare issues. And my guest is Jeff Manville, Jeff leads government affairs for Mercer. Hi, Jeff. Thank you for being here today. Hi, Tracy. It's great to be with you. So, Jeff, based on the polls that I've seen so far, healthcare looks like it is like the number two or number three issue with voters. You know, clearly the economy is the top issue. Um, but when we think about healthcare, affordability is something that is an issue for everyone. But, you know, it doesn't seem like healthcare has really been a central campaign issue for either one of the presidential candidates. There's, there's just not a whole lot of detail from either candidate or party. And I guess it's partially because the voters really focus on the issue, not so much the policy details. You know, we're, we're actually the ones who want the policy details, but we don't have much detail, do we? We don't, but um, you used the word affordability, and I think that's the operative word, right? I mean, that's that term has been used a lot on both the Republican and the Democratic side, it appears, in their platforms. Um, and um, there's not a lot of detail, but they are pretty remarkably aligned on health issues, uh, accepting reproductive rights in the Affordable Care Act, in the affordability realm. Um, they, they, they're asking for pretty much the same things in terms of um, at, you know, reforming uh, pharmacy benefit managers, more transparency uh, in Harris's case, uh, expanding the Inflation Reduction Act. Remember all of the uh, prescription drug reforms in, in, in that law that pertain to Medicare is a $2,000 cap on out-of-pocket spending for drugs, $35 a month cap on insulin, uh, other cost controls. She would like to extend those reforms to the commercial sector. Democrats tried to do that um, when they passed the Inflation Reduction Act, but they couldn't do it under the uh, the budget reconciliation rules. So, you know, they those and, and, and those goals also pretty much align with what Congress is trying to do. I think it also bears mentioning that there is a massive bipartisan agenda in Congress on affordability that incorporates some of the things I just mentioned that actually has a chance to pass before the year is out in the lame duck session. So um, I noticed in the news recently that Voya Financial released some survey results where um, they're reporting that nearly three-fourths of the workers that participated in their survey said that they would accept a new position, a new job with slightly less salary if better health care benefits were offered. And so let's let's go back to the Affordable Care Act. You mentioned that, you know, previously. But, you know, I think the big issue is that the subsidies are set to expire at the end of 2025. What what could happen with the ACA under a Harris White House versus a Trump? Well, uh, for Harris, I mean, she clearly wants to uh, protect and build on the ACA. That, of course, includes extending those enhanced ACA uh, marketplace subsidies that uh, expire at the end of next year. That's going to be a huge issue in Congress next year and will almost certainly be part of the, the, the huge tax debate next year over uh, – how to handle the the end of 2025 expiration of much of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act from 2015. So that will be part of the the mix. She will press very hard for that. Um, as I said, expanding those those IRA Medicare uh, drug provisions um, is a big one too, um, and it may also it, on Harris's. Uh, uh, agenda would pro probably be expanding the number of drugs within uh, the the Inflation Reduction Act that's that's subject to government negotiation, quote unquote. I think that's where she would would want to go. Um, Trump, um, you know, he apparently hasn't ruled out the possibility of trying to repeal the ACA, although Republicans in Congress are won't go along with that. Um, when you look at his first term, um, you know, recall that he he didn't do much to promote ACA coverage. Um, he would 
support allowing the expanded marketplace subsidies to expire. Um, but we'll see. I mean, he doesn't, he, you know, famously during his debate with uh, um, uh, Biden, he said he had a concept of a plan to replace the ACA. And then in the subsequent vice presidential debate, uh, Senator J.D. Vance said, um, uh, was talking a little bit about risk pools and and maybe seemed to be envisioning segmenting the the the, the insurance marketplace into smaller groups of people, maybe in a way that creates a high risk pool for folks that uh, have high high expenses uh, and allowing younger, healthier folks maybe to buy coverage uh, for less. So, um, yeah, where that might go. Um, isn't clear, but I most Republicans would re- think that Trump and Vance um, have kind of a muddled message on health care. They'd like them to talk more about affordability and costs and less about relitigating the ACA. So. Yeah, well, on that topic of affordability and costs, we're in the third year of health care cost increases that are around, you know, six to seven percent with pharmacy being the biggest driver of the cost increases. And, you know, neither candidate has really talked about pharmacy benefits and the PBMs, but that is beginning the attention of Congress in a big way this year. And so what are your thoughts on legislative action in 2025 as it relates to prescription drugs? Um, I think it really depends on what happens at the end of this year in the lame duck. Like, you know, I, I mentioned some of the provisions that were still in play. That includes um, uh, PBM reforms. Um, there are a number of those reforms that were in a bill passed by the House um, late last year, the Lower Costs, More Transparency Act, that passed the chamber by a huge, huge margin. That bill would uh, mandate some extensive reporting uh, by PBMs to plan sponsors um, on things like, um, you know, rebates, w- drug spending, formulary uh, placement rationale, a lot of things that would give plan sponsors um, a real clear uh, picture of their drug spend. There's also provisions pending in the Senate that would delink uh, uh uh, drug prices from PBM um, uh, compensation uh, would ban spread pricing. I think those two latter provisions are maybe less likely to pass this year. I think the the provision with the best chance of maybe passing this year or maybe next would be the more detailed reporting of PBMs to um, to plan sponsors. And then there are also provi- provisions out there, bills out there that would. Um, try to get more generics and biosimilars to market more quickly, you know, address this uh, issue of perceived abuses in the patent system that kind of keep, uh, can keep generics and biosimilars from, from getting to the market uh, faster than they, than they, uh, than they are, or otherwise would. Well, I know employers would be very happy to get more transparency, you know, more reporting from the PBMs. That would, that would be great. And, um, you know, we've been tracking the polls and have been interested in some speculation recently that control of power could slip in both the House and the Senate, still leaving us with a divided Congress, but kind of interesting to think that they would both slip. And just just interested to know, you know, what are your thoughts on the balance of power in 2025 and what that could mean for health policy? Yeah, I, I mean... Um... If you look at the most likely outcome now, and I think you, I think you hit on it. Maybe it's it's divided, continued divided government. Uh, but we'll see. If it is divided government, I think we'll see much of the current bipartisan agenda uh, addressing healthcare costs continue. Whatever they don't get done this year will almost certainly be revived next year. Um, if either party runs the table, um, though. Um, and uh, gets full control. If Republicans do it, I I think we have a bit of a concern in that as part of the tax debate. They, if they do run the table, they plan to use a process called budget reconciliation to push their tax priorities through without need for um, 
uh, 60 votes in the Senate. So conceivably, they could just push it through um, without any Democratic support. And we know that a num- some Republicans and some conservative leaning think tanks have proposed capping the employee tax income tax exclusion for employer provided health care. Um, you know, it's it's back again. Remember the Cadillac tax uh, it's sort of uh, a different variation on that theme. But um, we have to guard against that. And as you know, Tracy, you know, we at Mercer are working with other stakeholders and folks in the plan sponsor community to try to convince Congress that that's a bad idea. But that's something that could return. I don't want to overstate the threat, but we have to be prepared for it. On the Democratic side, again, if if it's a big if, because it looks like Republicans will take the Senate. But remember that um, the in the early years of the Biden administration, uh, Democrats tried to uh, pass the Build Back Better Act under this reconciliation process. That bill later became the Inflation Reduction Act that they got through on reconciliation. And we could see a return of proposals from that effort, like uh, a, a national um, a federal paid leave in, uh, entitlement, um, uh, civil penalties for running afoul of the mental health disparity rules, um, uh, things like that. We could we could see if Democrats fund the table too, but but that's looking like a long shot at this point. Well, that's a lot to think about, um, especially the your comment about um, interest. Um, you know, if the Republicans are in power in um, revisiting something along the lines of the Cadillac tax um, to generate revenue. So um, we'll definitely be keeping a really close eye on that. Um, we've also been paying more attention to the health policy issues at the state level this past year. You know, several of the state houses have been driving pharmacy legislation and, of course, Many of the states have ballot initiatives on abortion. We'll be keeping an eye on that. Jeff, I won't ask you to make any election predictions, but I will invite you back after the election results are in so that we can have a more focused conversation on what this all means from a health policy perspective and the potential impact on employer-sponsored health care benefits. So thank you for being here today, and thank you for sharing your thoughts with us on um, what's going on in this election season. Sure. Thanks, Tracy. So thank all of you for joining and we will see you next time.